So we're looking at our time of flight mass spectrometer, and now we have to figure out how we get our samples into the instrument and how they're ionized as well. So this is a syringe pump. Uh, our samples will be in solution form, so the sample is going to be contained right there. It's not going to take much sample at all. Uh, the syringe should contain 50 microliters of solution, and we won't even use all that to do our analysis. The flow rate will be set really low, so you, you can set the dials here. You'll, you'll see this when you actually go to, to run these experiments. Uh, but the flow rate should be set somewhere between 2 and 20 microliters per minute. And the sample will travel down this tube uh, and ultimately into the instrument. Uh, of course, it'll take time to go from one place to the next, especially because our flow rates are, are very low. So keep that in mind when you first turn on this pump that uh, <clears throat> your samples aren't immediately going to be observed. If we open the cover, uh, this is what you'll see. So the sample would be introduced right at this point over here, and it's going to travel down a short needle um, where it's, it's ejected from that tip. Uh, now, of course, if this is closed, that needle would be positioned right about here, and this hole is the entrance to the mass spectrometer. So there's a tube leading that, and as I mentioned before, that travels down to ultimately reach the flight tube. So our sample is going to be sprayed as a solution, and as it exits this tip, it's going to make this curved path going from one point to the other. Uh, this tip will be held at a very high positive potential to emit positive ions. And the process that's happening here is something called electrospray. So electrospray is the process of generating gas phase ions from solution. So if we start with our ions in solution, this is what we'd actually have. Depending whether it's an acid or a base and the the, the basicity or acidity, the pH of the solution, this is what you might encounter. So imagine if you have an acid and it's under basic conditions, that would lead to deprotonation uh, to create this ion right here. Uh, and if we have a base and we add acid to that, then we can create uh, another ion here. So a negative ion or a positive ion. Now this is also assuming that our ions were neutral to begin with, uh, so there's a lot of other scenarios in here, but what I'm trying to get at is that depending on the pH of the solution, we can create positive or negative ions for our sample. <clears throat> of course, they're still in solution, and we have to find a way to remove that solvent and ultimately lead to gas phase ions, because that's what mass spectrometry demands. So that's actually what electrospray really is about. If we have our ions in here, so we have an analyte, let's say M, and then it's protonated, uh, which gives it that positive charge. So that's what I'm representing over here. Uh, the positive charge, of course, negative would be the, the counterbalance. Our needle uh, is going to have a very high positive potential applied to it. So a high positive voltage is applied to the needle right here. And if our ions are positive, that means that they don't like this positive potential. They're going to be pushed to the other end. The mass spectrometer itself is going to be held at ground. So that's going to jump uh, our solution from this point here down to the other, the other end. And in the process of doing that, you'll actually be expelling these small little droplets of solution. Those droplets would contain a multitude of charges. And uh, in the space going from the, the, the exit of that tip to the entrance of the mass spectrometer, there'll be a, a series of events that lead to desolvation of this ion, of these droplets, and eventual formation of gas phase ions. I won't give you the full details of electrospray. Uh, that's something that you could look up. Uh, but what you should remember is that we start in solution and we finish in the gas phase, and somehow, magically, we'll just say the solvent disappears. This is a, a, a real image of the electrospray process. So there's our, our needle. Our solution is starting in here, and we're ma imagining that it's already positively charged. Uh, and if we apply a high positive potential to that needle, then it's going to force the ions to leave this tip. And it creates this sort of jetting process. You notice the, the pathway of that, and it's, it's easy to imagine why that would be because we have all these positive droplets that are formed. So every one of these little, little mists uh, are already positively charged. They're going to want to repel each other, so they sort of spray out in this process. And beginning over here, we have larger droplets that sort of shrink their way down, and eventually you're left with, with these single ions in the gas phase. <clears throat> now, the key thing to remember about electrospray is this right here. 
whatever the mass of our compound is, by the time we've protonated it, of course, it will have a different mass. That mass will be approximately one mass unit higher than the mass of our original compound. So if you were to detect uh, in the mass spectrometer some signal, let's say a signal of 100 m over z, the real mass of our molecule is, isn't going to be 100. You're going to have to account for that mass of the proton. So you'll have to subtract it. And when I say approximately 1, well, this is the exact number, 1.007825. I'll explain a little bit more about that in a second. Um, but that's something that you, you must know. You must be realizing that that mass has to be a little bit different. Of course, uh, here we're assuming that we have one proton, but who's to say that we don't have two protons that attach? So we could have polyprotic systems, uh, and we could attach two positive charges uh, to our mass. And then there's even other things that can happen. So why not this? Maybe there's a sodium ion, and uh, I'll put the sodium that's charged in there as well. Um, but if we have a sodium ion attachment, then that will also create a charged compound as well with its own unique mass. So if you happen to generate these species, then to get the, the real mass of this compound, well, here there's sort of two ways to do it. You could take whatever mass you've detected and subtract one, and then multiply that total mass by two, or you could multiply the mass you observed by two and then subtract two times that mass of the proton. Either way, uh, you know that you're subtracting two proton charges. Um, for here, you'd simply need to know the mass of our sodium, which is about 23. There's the exact number. Uh, but I guess the bigger question is, how do you know what the attachment is? I mean, you won't be seeing uh, in our mass spectrum uh, an ion that looks like this and say, oh, by the way, this is a sodium attachment. Um, it'll just show you this compound, and then the attachment is going to be really m plus x. So how do you know what to subtract? And the real answer is you don't. Um, so the real mass of our molecule will depend on what happened to stick to it. What we're really going to have to do is just try to find a way to ensure that we have a, a good chance of generating one of these two species. So what we will be doing is making sure that the residual sodium in our solution is as low as we possibly can make it. So that means using very pure solvents, uh, so the, the, the highest purity water that we can find. And our initial sample, we're going to run it through an extraction procedure to ensure cleanup. So if there happens to be any salt in your original sample, you're going to want to desalt that. You're going to find a way to purify our compound so that it doesn't add this extra sodium. That will ensure that the most likely chance is to attach by a proton, and then we can make our magic assumption that we're going to subtract that, that proton mass.